Well, the inter-American human rights system is taking a very progressive and, a, and active approach to indigenous human rights to property. They have linked indigenous human rights over traditional lands to established notions of property. Central to this approach is the principle that possession of land per se qualifies for international legal recognition, notwithstanding the community's lack of real title under their domestic laws. So that's the, the general approach that has been taken by the inter-American human rights system. Now what I want to do now is just talk about some of the cases that they have dealt with. So the first one um, was the first case to be dealt with, which is the case of the Awastini people in Nicaragua. The Awastini people in Nicaragua um, were, were contesting the fact that the government of Nicaragua had granted concessions to, uh, to international logging companies to log over their traditional lands. And that the Nicaraguan government had not recognized the Augustini people's right to land um, and had not issued titles or demarcated those lands. So the argument again was that Nicaragua had violated the right to property by granting these concessions and by not titling and demarcating that the right to property includes the collective right of indigenous peoples to enjoy their traditional lands and natural resources. So the, it was being argued that the Nicaraguan, or the uh, Agostini people in Nicaragua should have the same human rights as other people, that they should have the same protection of that framework of human rights to property as other people. Um, they argued that Nicaragua had violated the right to an effective remedy uh, by failing to ensure the enjoyment of the indigenous land rights that are affirmed in the Nicaraguan constitution and laws. Um, they said that for indigenous communities, uh, the relation to the lands are not merely a matter of possession and production, but a material and spiritual element which they must fully enjoy even to preserve their cultural legacy and transmit it to future generations. The court, or the, um, yeah, the court in this case said that the Nicaragua must cease uh, acts which could cause the agents of the states or third parties to affect the existence, value, use, and enjoyment of the property of the Augustini community. That Nicaragua must adopt measures of legislative, administrative, and, what other, and whatever other character for the effective delimitation, demarcation, and titling of indigenous lands. The land titling process must be in accordance with the customary law, values, usage, and customs of the communities and with their full participation. So you can see that this is beginning to be a much different picture than what we have in Canada. The next case is the case of Dan versus the United States. In this case, uh, the Dan sisters were, were from the Western Shoshone people in Nevada, in the United States. And um, they were subject to the um, United States government uh, confiscating uh, um, horses that they were raising and so forth. And uh, that for two, two decades, um, they had asserted that Aboriginal title uh, rights to the Western Shoshone's ancestral lands and that the United States had considered that these had been extinguished by gradual encroachment, um, including large-scale uh, gold mining and other environmentally damaging activity uh, on these lands that were still being used by the Western Shoshone. Uh, they went to the Supreme Court uh, of the United States um, uh, and uh, were not successful, so they went to the Inter-American Human Rights System. And after consideration, the commission uh, uh, concluded that uh, the violations that, that they were asserting um, were continuing and ongoing and were a prima facie violation of the rights protected by the inter-American human rights system. And on that, they declared that the, uh, the Dan case was admissible. <clears throat> In that case, the Inter-American Commission, because like Canada, they haven't signed on to the treaty uh, with respect to 
to uh, the Inter-American uh, uh, Convention on Human Rights so that they couldn't go to the court, they could only go as far as the commission. But the commission said that the United States had failed to adequately address the Western Shoshone claim to ancestral lands through administrative and judicial proceedings. The commission used an evolutive approach, evolutive, <laughs> evolution approach, uh, in interpreting the obligation of the United States under the American Declaration by applying the entire spectrum of, inter, uh, entire spectrum of international human rights legal developments relevant to indigenous peoples, including rights under the UN and other international instruments. So the United States was arguing, as Canada has argued in our case, well, we didn't sign on to that treaty, so it doesn't apply to us. So therefore, we don't have to abide by it. In this case, the Inter-American Commission said, well, we're not looking at it just from the perspective of that one treaty. And the fact that you didn't sign on to that treaty isn't good enough to say that it doesn't apply to you. Because we're going to look at the broad spectrum of international law. And we're going to say that you know, this broad spectrum of international law applies. And, and we will apply it to this case. They rule that where property and user rights of indigenous peoples arise from rights existing prior to the creation of a state, indigenous peoples have the right to recognition by that state of the permanent and inalienable title of in, uh, indigenous peoples um, relative thereto, and to have such title changed only by mutual consent between the state and the representative indigenous peoples where they have full knowledge and appreciation of the nature or attributes of such property. This also implies the right to fair compensation in the event that such property and user rights are irrevocably lost. So we see now that you know, the inter-American human rights system is, is pushing this even further. They're saying, okay, in the case of the United States, even though you haven't signed on to that treaty, we're still gonna apply international law. Even though these things happened prior to the creation of the state, indigenous people still have rights to those lands, and it can only be changed with their mutual consent, and they have to have full knowledge and appreciation of the attributes of the property, and if they cannot get the land back, that they're, that they're entitled to fair compensation. So we see that this international human rights system is pushing the law way beyond what the Court of Appeal in Canada has done, or in British Columbia. The next case then is, uh, what time are we supposed to be done? Eight? Uh, are we, we're finished at eight, I guess is my question. I can go on, okay, okay. So the next case then um, is uh, the Maya uh, people uh, versus Belize. And here, um, 37 Maya communities brought a petition alleging that uh, Belize had granted logging and oil concessions over 700,000 acres of uh, rainforest um, uh, and that they had failed to recognize and protect the Maya traditional land and resource uh, tenure rights. And they alleged uh, that Belize had violated their, the human rights, uh, their human rights. Here, um, the court found, or I guess it was the commission, found that uh, Belize uh, had violated uh, Section 23, again, of the, of the uh, Convention on Human Rights, uh, by failing to take effective measures to recognize the communal property rights of the lands traditionally occupied and used by the Maya. Um, that they violated Article 23 by granting concessions to third parties to utilize the traditional property and resources of the Maya people without obtaining effective consultations, and by granting concessions to lands that must be delimited, demarcated, and titled, and otherwise uh, clarified and protected. That the, the right to use and enjoy property may be impeded when the state uh, when the state itself and third parties acting with the acquiescence and, and tolerance of the state affect the, ex, uh, the, affect the existence, value, use, or enjoyment of the property. And then they say that um, 
The inter-American human rights system has recognized that the property rights protected by the system are not limited to those property interests that are already recognized by states or that are defined by domestic law, but rather that the right to property has an autonomous meaning within the international human rights law. And this is interesting because they're saying that there doesn't have to be domestic recognition in order for the international law to protect the rights of indigenous peoples and that they are autonomous. In Canadian domestic law, the, the courts have talked about this concept called sui generis. Sui generis meaning something that is not recognized under the common law and that Aboriginal rights are of this class of rights called sui generis rights. In the international law, they're saying it's autonomous. It isn't dependent on recognition by the state. So, um, you know, they, they're pushing these concepts further. Um, they go on and say that, um, again, uh, that the communal property right of the Maya people is not dependent upon particular interpretations of domestic judicial decisions concerning the possible existence of Aboriginal rights under the common law. They go on, this obligation necessarily requires the state to effectively de delimit, demarcate the territory to which the Maya people's property right extends, to take appropriate measures, um, uh, oh, to take appropriate measures to protect the right uh, to the territory, including official recognition of that right, um, necessarily includes engaging in effective and informed consultations with the Maya people concerning the boundaries of the territory and the traditional land use practices and customary land tenure systems be taken into account in that system. The next case is the Saramaki people versus Suriname. And um, here it was the, uh, a dam that was built in the 1960s, the Afrobaca Dam that was built in the 1960s had flooded a large area of the Sar Saramaki's people's uh, traditional territory. And they argued that, um, they, that the state had not obtained their consent and that there were a number of displaced Saramaki people as a result of this, that it had a painful effect upon them that uh, it reduced the subsistence resources that they were able to uh, rely on, that there was destruction of Saramaki's sacred sites, there was a lack of respect for the interned remains of the deceased Saramaki people, there was environmental damages that were being done, and that the state had a plan to raise, to increase the level of the dam and uh, you know, cause more flooding, which would again displace more of the Saramaki people. So they brought their case forward. Here, the court had this to say. Uh, the court observed that although so-called judge-made law may certainly be a means for the recognition of the rights of individuals, particularly under common law legal systems, like in Canada, the availability of such a procedure does not in and of itself comply with the state's obligation to give legal effect to the rights recognized in the American Convention. That is, the mere possibility of recognition of rights through a certain judicial process is no substitute for the actual recognition of such rights. So the argument that, well, you can go to court and prove it, and that's really Canada's position. Canada's position is, well, First Nations, if you believe that you have a right to land, you have believe that you have a right to title to land, go to court and prove it. The state's obligation to provide judicial recourse is not simply met by the mere existence of courts or formal procedures or even the possibility of resorting to the courts. Rather, the state has to adopt affirmative measures to guarantee that the recourses it provides through the justice system are really effective for determining the existence of a human rights violation and providing a corresponding compensation. Very much at the opposite extreme, I would say, than what the Court of Appeal in British Columbia said, right? That, again, the reconciliation process 
has got to be, you know, this balancing of of indigenous people's rights with the rights of all other Canadians and, and that they don't want to unnecessarily interfere with sovereignty and an overly broad recognition of title would not be, you know, in the best interests. Uh, I mean, this is a much different approach to the whole concept of somehow reconciliation. Mm -hmm.